Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 775. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's December 2nd, 2022. What's going on with your lighting, guys? It looks so dark behind you. Well, we're actually recording this the night before on December for a Thursday because I'm not available tomorrow. I'm supposed to be going on a tour in New York City with family, so I won't be here to record. George, the trooper, George, who's just had an amazingly busy day, probably busy week, says, oh, we could do it at 4.30 or 5, Kevin. Don't worry about that. So I know George says he can, but both of us are going to be yawning. I brought backup coffee, so we'll see how this goes. Before we get too far into the program, please like, share, subscribe, comment, Sign up for the podcast. Do all the things you're going to do as a wonderful audience. George and I both know that Anglican Unscripted is not just about us. It's about you, the audience, who are faithful participants, wonderful commenters, and people who share Anglican Unscripted when they find it on Facebook or YouTube. George, you're upright. How are you doing today? Uh, Very busy. We've had three functions, uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night at the church. And today I've had meetings. I had a parish. De- I had a pastor, uh, a parishioner die. And tomorrow morning, I'm glad we're not filming in the morning because I have to be in court to accompany parishioner as they make a victim's impact statement to our local criminal court um, in in a uh, conjunction with an assault case. So wow. uh, they've got brain damage. Um, <laughs> oh no! No, no! I mean, no. they they were. Uh, uh, well, they have epilep- They were assaulted, hit in the head, and they now have epile- epileptic fits. And uh, uh, I'm there to not make any expert witness testimony, but just to sort of hold their hand as they go through all this stuff. Wow. So it's exciting. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you get so involved in the life of the people of whom you serve and whom you're with. It's just uh, every day is a different day. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if every day is the same, you're doing it wrong. Same with business. Same with international politics if you're doing something like making a deal with china and it goes right you were wrong because it'll never go right it's a communist country so if the roman catholic church makes a deal with the chinese government and says hey we will let you help appoint bishops and bring the church along as long as we can have access to your people what could go wrong where do we sign George, what could go wrong? Well, everything will go wrong. Uh, the Catholic Church has been beaten up for the past few years for its signing a deal with the devil, where it basically is uh, given the Catholic Church uh, equal authority in the appointing of bishops and the running of the church. They're doing it together, they say. Well, this was to basically legitimize the underground Roman Catholic Church and you sort of reunify it with the official Catholic Patriotic Association, which was the church, state-backed Catholic Church. Well, this happened, but what has happened since then? Well, the Chinese communists have reneged on their deal, and they reneged in the most powerful way possible. They appointed a new bishop. Uh, They appointed John, uh, John Peng, I'll just stop there. That's, uh, I mean, they appointed it's, John it's Peng, a, a Chinese name. Yes, they appointed him a bishop of an of uh, an auxiliary bishop of different diocese, and they've redrawn diocesan boundaries. They're basically torn up the agreement, uh, moving bishops around, moving dioceses around, and totally ignoring the Catholic Church in Rome. Uh, this is uh, well, I guess. The I told you so's are going to start any moment now from the But critics. you and I, and meanwhile, at least, and meanwhile, well, the cardinal in Hong Kong who was arrested and uh, he was convicted of uh, basically of a political crime. He was because he was in his 80s, they only fined him, they didn't put him into jail. But there's been no public support from the Vatican for the cardinal in Rome, uh, in Hong Kong. It's just a bad showing. Uh, by the Catholic Church, the official Catholic Church in Rome, in, as regards China. Yeah, it, it's hard to see you. I remember uh, 
complained about this in last January and February when you know we're first seeing the deal being revealed, and poof, look what happened. Uh, communism will always be communism. They will make promises. Socialism will always be socialism. They'll make promises they don't intend to keep, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how the underground church, which is not all Roman Catholic, uh, survives this or learns from this. You know, Chinese aren't there to make deals with. Well, and also we're starting to see reports that the crackdown option, we basically posited two options, uh, a reform government or a crackdown on protesters. And the stories we're getting out of uh, secondhand from Chinese people who, who can read Chinese social media posts are that the uh, police are coming out in force, arresting people, people are disappearing off the streets. Um, it looks like uh, Chairman Xi is going to fight to the death and not take any prisoners in this thing. Well, he now, has that's the today. Yeah. It could have, it, you know, China has a surveillance state where I think there's one security camera for every seven people. And the state basically has the pictures of everybody in these protests and they are going around arresting them. Well, they don't so even they're need not the picking them up in the street. They're yeah. picking them up at their homes at 4 a.m. They don't need the pictures, George. Uh, because of the the deal they made with Apple, Apple has all their data and personal records kept by Apple users in servers in China, and it's available to the Chinese government upon request. I was watching videos yesterday of Chinese police taking iPhones. They didn't do this with other phones, but I see he takes an iPhone 13 from a uh, an individual, puts a little code in, and he's reading through. He didn't ask the guy what the what his passcode was, unless they have some type of psyche communique I'm not aware of there, and pu puts uh, some type of Chinese code in there uh, that was given to the state, the, the CCP, and he's reading through this uh, person's text. That's the Isn't tools. Is this the same company that refused to assist the FBI on a terrorism case in California where the terrorists had an iPhone mm -hmm. and they wouldn't help the FBI crack it no. to get the information about the co-conspirators? Yes. Yeah, the, 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 the FBI paid a, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Jeff, $1 million to plug a little tool into the iPhone and, uh, and, and, and break it for them to crack it open. And they said, can we have this technology? He says, nope, $1 million a phone. Since then, there's been no reports of how many phones this, uh, Jeff has opened. Um, but uh, it's not in a tool that's available to the United States government. Thank God, because we have a First Amendment, right, George? Well, Kevin, have you spoken to Jeff about funding our trip to GAFCON in Kigali? <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, no, Jeff's an atheist. But a really good hacker at that. Um, let's move on to some other news here. I have, oh, well, this was a story in decades, maybe centuries in, in, in the making. Uh, the official populist census was released somewhere that we saw, I don't know if it was a Pew report, but Christians are now the minority in England and Wales. And uh, there's a couple different reasons for this. It might be immigration. It may be that parents just aren't teaching their kids. It may be that uh, we've just reached such a pagan, heated society that religion is, is an afterthought. Um, but what do we know about these numbers, George? Well, Kevin, I think you hit the highlights. Um, the population of Christian, uh, identified Christians in England and Wales fell below 50% for the first time. And the gains come from no religion reported and gains in other minority religions, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. And these are not people converting to Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. These, this is immigration. Um, England has proportionately an immigration problem, uh, unfettered, unchecked immigration akin to the United States. But the United States is fortunate in that our illegal immigrants are almost all Christians from South America and around conservative, the world. And they're conservative. And they're conservative. Yeah. Whereas uh, Muslim immigrants from Pakistan and Bangladesh and the Middle East and Afghanistan and mm -hmm. Albania and North Africa, Albania, and they're not. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Calvin Robinson, who recently appeared on this show, uh, said something and did something in public that no Englishman has been able to do on social media for a generation, which is support Enoch Powell, 
uh, who in the 1960s gave a very, he was a very brilliant uh, parliamentarian cabinet minister who basically said that uh, immigration, unchecked, unfettered immigration will irreversibly change the face of British society. And at the time, everybody said, oh, pal, you're a racist, you're this, you're that. Well, Calvin Robinson, who is um, who has a Jamaican father and an English mother, said that, you know, Powell was right, that immigration has changed Britain, and it has not been for the better. Now, the other thing that we're seeing is that the, the proportion of older Christians has remained fairly constant. It's young people who are giving the answer of no religion, so that the faith is not being passed from one generation to another. Now, why is that? Could it be that uh, it's the failure of the institutional religion? I put a big part of the blame there. Mm -hmm. But probably it's more of the failure of the parents. They just don't see the value of religion for their children. Now, and I, I have a, to put my two cents in here. Uh, my generation uh, and the generation before me, observationally, this is Kevin's observation, was very humble about what um, assets they have and where it came from. My grandparents firmly believed everything they got came from God. My parents somewhat believed that. I and my wife firmly believe that. My kids, not so much. My kids' generation, uh, no, we work for this. This is ours. And uh, um, if it wasn't for us, we wouldn't have anything. And I think there's kind of this this more hedonistic, uh, paganist, Gnostic understanding of Western society that's taking hold that if 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 I don't believe my gifts are from God and my possessions came from God, uh, why why would I need God? Why do I need to be thankful? Well, the the two hopeful signs on the horizon there. Um, Terry Mattingly wrote about this uh, uh, that. The U.S. also had the, the 2020 religious census reports released in the last few weeks, and there's been no major shift. But one of the things that uh, Terry Mattingly says is that has reported from the, the surveys is that institutional religion has lost numbers, but the numbers of Christians are roughly the same. The state of Florida, for instance, every county, more than 15 percent are non-denominational Christians where that's now actually a group of, of people. So it's not that in the United States the people are losing their faith in Jesus Christ, they're losing their faith in the institutional church. And the other sto story I saw that I find very encouraging is that the Barnack Organization, which is a well-respected polling organization, polled 26,000 children, I think it was 26,000 children, in a dozen countries around the world. And they find that the 12 to 18-year-old cohort is more open to Jesus Christ than the previous Generation Z. Generation Z are your children and my children's age, mm -hmm. the people in their 20s right now. The people in their teens maybe are, uh, for, for reasons I can't quite understand, are more in, open to the message of God and Jesus Christ than the kids 10 years older. So, well, I, I think it's obvious we have, we're raising up an unfulfilled generation. Uh, mm -hmm. They can see what's happening around them. They see uh, the internet, they see online, they see their uh, families gathering and all they do is play games, board games and stuff like that. They don't see any fulfillment in their life. Well, what is the purpose of life is if, if we're all there is? And the answer is, well, we, we're not all there is. There's something much bigger than us. Uh, we were created, we have a purpose, and each of us have a purpose. And I think there's a generation, the generation that's unfulfilled, that is looking beyond Westernism for that purpose, beyond possession, mm. beyond um, the current things going on. And I, I hope you're right, George. Uh, we need that spark. Well, it also gives a profound challenge. Well, mm. I'll speak now for American churches. Um, the, the other thing that Barna reported is that this generation of teenagers praises a high premium on what they perceive to be justice. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the church to basically respond, justice is found in Jesus Christ, not justice in the social warrior sense that your and my children uh, follow. So we as 
Christian leaders, as Christian teachers, as Christian parents have an obligation to go and meet these kids where they are and share with them the truth of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, sadly, no, in this day and age, and we're just off kilter, it's late. Uh, in this day and age, to them, justice means fairness, and fairness means mm -hmm. justice. And it's you know completely uh, disregarding what we've uh, reasoned over the last uh, four or 5,000 years of what justice really is, and the justice that Christ and God has provided us, and what God's justice really means. That's a, that's a big step for <laughs> the unfulfilled generation. Uh, let's move on to some other news here. Um, Monir Nice, one of my favorite bishops, has posted a uh, statement, and it's called, Are We Really a Communion? You can find that on Anglican.inc. And he goes to talk about what's happened over the decades and where things sit today and what could trigger a different leadership in the Anglican Communion. And uh, very impressive, Bishop Manier. I, I, uh, if I get a chance, I'll, I'll send you an email. Maybe we could do an interview on in this for next week. But yeah, it, it may be time, George. Two things to take away from the St. Andrew's Day statement it was released on November 30th. We alluded to what we saw in it, but didn't really say. But now we can say outright that if the Church of England's bishops approve same-sex blessings or same-sex marriage, the leadership of the Archbishop of Canterbury as the first among equals in the Anglican Communion will be terminated by the primates. In other words, I'll have another primates meeting and they will say, thank you, Justin, but we're voting you out of office. And we will move from a communion to a federation because the Church of England will have entered apostasy. And second of all, there will be positive steps to minister to those clergy, churches, dioceses, bishops, whatever they are, who wish to remain faithful to the faith once received as held by the global Anglican majority. So what does that mean? That means we're where uh, it's, it's flying bishops time. It's invasion sure. time. It, already Gafcon has put a bulkhead or a beachhead uh, on the shores of Britain. Now the global South is saying the global South who has a wonderful uh, centuries long love for the sea centuries yeah centuries long love for the sea of canterbury is like we're you do this it's over we're gonna come and re-evangelize britain too wow yeah, it it well, gafcon's already made a beachhead in the anglican network in europe mm -hmm. but now global south will either we don't know how it's playing out because they're ha the conversations are live right now yeah uh with English bishops, English archbishops, retired, uh, clergy, di lay leaders, with the Global South, with the ANIE. So we don't know what it's going to look like. They don't know what it's going to look like. The next meeting of General Synod is in February, I believe, February 2023. And in the weeks to come, this new coalition called Orthodox Anglicans uh, will basically start dropping bombs week by week by week. And essentially, they know that they're not going to derail the gay activists in General Synod, but they can twist the arms of the bishops. And the difficulty is getting all the conservatives on the same page. Yeah. Um, there's the, we reported about the St. Hugh's conversations where a group of self-selected conservatives met with a group of self-selected liberals and Simon Butler, a liberal priest, put out a, a, uh, an article on the Via Media website, which is Jan O'Zane's, the pro-gay website, basically saying that the conservatives are hopelessly divided and some of them are willing to come to an accommodation and take a gentleman's agreement to trust the establishment to, do the, to treat them fairly. This has caused a massive blowback from the 99.9% .9 of evangelicals excluded from this conversation because they're saying it's the same old good old boys who sold us out how many times so that these people can continue to have their positions and perquisites and power we're not going to take it so you know, 
this agreement means nothing changes if they come to an agreement. Yeah, so the Orthodox Anglican group needs to find a way to basically gather people that are being atomized by the St. Hugh conversations, who Anglo-Catholics still don't trust the evangelicals, and the evangelicals still don't trust the Anglo-Catholics, and so on and so forth. They've got their work cut out for them. But they are adopting a quasi-pan-Anglican strategy, which I've mentioned in the past, which is having outside Anglican leaders exercise influence. Plus, they are seeking to take the battle politically and theologically to General Synod and to the, uh, to the airwaves and, and win England for Christ. Yeah. That's what I want. That's what you want. Uh, let's do. We have never really done a Florida man story. We now have two that we're going to talk about today. The first Florida man story is Charlie Holt was elected by a unanimous unanimous vote a couple weeks ago to be the next bishop of the diocese of Florida. That's his second election. Uh, that should be everything. That should do it. We have an objection filed today that says, wait a minute, that may not be all. I think we found something where we can overthrow his uh, election. And we should talk about that here. Florida man story, George. Well, it, Charlie Holt was elected on the first ballot. It wasn't unanimous, but the first ballot, which is mm -hmm. pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah he I received didn't, two what happened in Humanis. I'm sorry, my, my fault. He, it's he, which is pretty good. He got two thirds of the laity and two thirds of the clergy on the first ballot of the second election. Well, the lay, the lay margin was pretty strong. The, the, the clergy margin was narrow, where there is uh, one, he had enough plus, he had two thirds plus one vote amongst the total registered clergy. Well, some dirty best, some dirty tricks were played. Uh, after the election was over, the diocese released the names of those clergy who were present and voted. It did not release how they voted, but just present and voted. And the objectors said, aha, this fellow says he was not there. Here's his sworn statement. So that means that Charlie Holt did not get a majority because we move it back one, therefore he, uh, failed the two-thirds majority, therefore we have to start the whole thing over again. Now, it's quite clear to me, uh, I can't prove this, but somebody knew that some old guy wasn't going to show up, or somebody, you know, some friends registered for somebody who wasn't going to come to keep this in their back pocket so that they could file a formal complaint saying that somebody voted who shouldn't have voted. Well, that... Uh, that's just dirty pool. They, um, I, I'm firmly convinced that this was a put-up job by those objecting. They're led by Kurt Uncle, the failed dean at General Seminary, Kate Moorhead, the uh, dean at the cathedral, who was a classmate of mine in seminary. Uh, she recently came out and supported gay marriage and said the cathedral in Jacksonville would be open to gay marriage, basically sticking her finger in the eye of Sam Howard, the bishop, who basically says, talk to me first before you make any public statements. So the same people last time are now protesting this time. Plus, they're also saying that it was uh, not fair to have Charlie Holt hired by the diocese after his uh, election was overturned and for him to act as a quasi-bishop. Well, that wasn't Charlie Holt's decision. It was Sam no. Howard's decision. You, and the you, you, decision. you and I raised the same question. It, it, it's an eyebrow raiser, but it was we, we said at the time it wasn't Charlie's decision uh, to do that. Um, and let us, you know, hey, this is our opinion. We have no proof in this. Um, but it, at the end of the day, a third round of ejections, it's starting to smell. You know, there, there's this, the, and to me, this stinks. And yes, we are all about fair elections, but uh, something happened here. Uh, that I would like to get to the bottom of. Who checked who in? So, mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if uh, if this is a valid objection or not. Uh, we'll let the lawyers figure that one out. Mm -hmm. But 
uh, this objection will be taken up to the national church level, and they'll have a committee look at it. The committee might say that, well, according to a hard reading of the rulings, we've got to do it a third time. So it's, as I agree with you, Kevin, this stinks. This is just a liberal group that wants to deny Charlie Holt the, t the office of bishop because they want the Diocese of Florida to be a gay bastion, whereas three quarters, two thirds of its members do not. Yeah. And if they go gay, they go woke. If they go, well, it's, an, it's a supply chain issue of wokeness is what it is. Um, let's talk about our next Florida man story. It's a Disney story. I live pretty close to Disney. Bob Iger is back. What? I did <laughs> for for most of our audience, you didn't know he was gone. He retired a couple of years ago. He was the CEO of Disney. Uh, he helped uh, keep it alive in the late 90s, all through the 2000s. Uh, very innovative, kept the parks clean and fun, and made Disney, for the most part, a non political entity that could reach all facets of society and children. I remember taking my kids to Toy Story 1 two and three i cried at the end of toy story three george that was that <laughs> i would have not cried a, a recent woke disney movie but you know it, it got me and so uh he's back but why would he come back why wh what's wrong with the old ceo who just stepped down and or got fired uh what's going bob on Chapek, on november 20th the board of directors fired bob chapik the ceo of disney mm -hmm. disney stock i think has lost three quarters of its value um, the adage, go woke, go broke, is applied to Walt Disney Corporation. Walt Disney got into a fight with the state of Florida, and the state of Florida said, fine, uh, we'll revoke your special tax treatment of your properties, and now you've got to pay taxes like everybody else. Um, and Disney's just, as an investment, the people are losing their shirt who own Disney stock. And so they got rid of the old Bob and got the, the old, they got rid of the new Bob and replaced him with the old Bob. The old Bob had a town, the new Bob had a town hall meeting with Disney employees this past week. And he said it was a major mistake for the Disney corporation to publicly oppose the Florida legislature's bill HB 1557. That's the bill that the opponents called the don't say gay bill. Which is a is, which is a false does, reading of doesn't it. Doesn't say that at all. No, yeah. What it does say is that third graders and under should not be quizzed about their sexuality. Teachers may not hide from parents things about this. That a preschool teacher should not be talking about sex with its their four or five year old uh, students. Which, you know, when I was in second and third grade. Uh, Miss Barney's first name was Miss. I didn't even know her first name, let alone her sexuality history. Yeah, no. And now we've got some weird people in the school systems who want to talk to six-year-olds about their sex lives and their weekends. Well, the Florida legislature banned that, and Disney got on board against it. And this was a fiasco for Disney, where it lost its tax, uh, tax uh, benefits from the state. And this latest project that uh, Bob Chapek uh, steered through Disney is an animated film called Strange World. It just opened. Well, Strange World had a $180 million budget, and its first weekend was expected to take in $40 million plus, and the first week about 60 to $70 million. It's only taken in $29 million so far, a week, week and a half on. And so it's expected to lose almost a hundred million dollars. Uh, this this animated feature has a gay main character, and is shot full of transgenderism and pro LGBTQ stuff. And America's parents are not taking their kids to this movie, and Disney's going to take another hundred million dollar hit. And it's not the first movie in this month to bomb. There was a, another Hollywood movie called Bros which was about a gay relationship and stuff like that. Nobody went to see it. And, and when interviewing people, they said, well, it did, that's not a topic that interests us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, why would we go see something? We, we don't want your culture forced down our throat. 
we will be accepting, but we're not, you know, we're not going to be affirming. And it's going to be interesting to watch that because all the Hollywood reporters said, well, the nation is still homophobic if they refuse to see it. You know, it's just, okay. You know, I... Well, y- the Trafalgar Group, which is a polling organization, recently released a survey that's found that 70% of Americans are less likely to do business with Disney, mm-hmm. meaning go to their movies, go to their theme parks, buy their products, watch their shows on television because of Disney's political activism. So when Bob Iger was rehired, Disney's stock bumped up. But when you've got 70% of the nation predisposed against you, let's put it this way. Uh, Joe Biden is more popular with the American public than the Walt Disney Corporation. Walt Disney has got a long road back uh, to regain the trust of the American people. Full disclosure, I kind of recently bought some Disney stock in the last day or two. Just full disclosure. So you're you're taking a risk, Kevin. You're taking a risk. Oh, and taking a good risk, you know, uh, because if he can return uh, the business model uh, to the model of the late 90s and, and early 2000s, I, I'd be very happy. Uh, the growth of the stock over that time was 80%, you know, and plus they, they had a couple uh, share breaks three for five and something. I, I, you guys don't care about that. But it's interesting, you know, Florida Stan, it's interesting in the fact that for the longest time, we could never establish a, a place where we could stop wokeism. You know, well, of course we could stop it in Florida. But to the point where um, the liberals don't have enough funding or money to support liberalism, to support the woke agenda. They don't go to the movies. There's enough of them out there to fully fund these movies uh, and go to them and buy them and, and get all the popcorn they want, but they're not doing either. They don't want to shove down their throat either for, at the end of the day. You know, it, it is what it is. Let's go on to our next story, George. Uh, here's the news template. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. One of my favorite stories. I used to be a holder of Twitter stock. I'm no longer, thanks to Elon Musk, who bought it from me. Um, Elon Musk is really shaking up uh, Twitter. Uh, if you watch any of the news feeds of the major news networks, Twitter is closing its doors and dying any minute now, George. Any minute. You just watch and you're going to go to twitter.com and you're going to get the 404 screen and it will tell you they can't find it. And that's what the narrative is, that you are not allowed to go into uh, a app a social media uh, site like Twitter or Facebook and change things up because the liberals have over the last decade really tuned it to the tool they wanted. And you're not going to take that tool away from them. Well, Elon has, and it's been a very painful three weeks to watch it uh, play out. Uh, I don't think Elon's gone through any pain at all because he's, he's, he doesn't twit Twit. Tweet as much as Trump did, but he's out there every day just trolling people who are complaining about him. And he is the chief troll, not just the tweet, uh, chief twit. So why is this a news story on, on scripted, George? Well, Elon Musk on Twitter tweeted that, uh, yes, Twitter did, and this is a quote, interfere in elections in the United States. So That's yes, a felony. And, you know, specifically, yeah, well, it it basically either hid news or slanted news or um, refused to discuss news. It was you know they admitted that lying about the Hunter Biden laptop uh, was a mistake. That uh, it was ru- they said it was Russian disinformation when they knew it otherwise, and. Uh, Musk went on to say, and these are quotes, the company failed for a very long time, another quote, but Twitter 2.0 will be more effective, transparent, and even-handed. So that Musk, meanwhile, has laid off about three quarters of the staff of Twitter. You never know. And you'd never know. <laughs> so basically, and you know, he's done stuff like gotten rid of uh, free, free meals, uh, all the perks that made this uh, a wonderful job for people and now he's basically putting into twitter the cult the 
work ethic that he has, which is 60, 70 hour weeks rather than 20 hour weeks uh, that most of the employees had before. And he really does want, he's more of a libertarian than I'm a conservative uh, and that he has uh, a number of views which I don't share. But by the same token, one of those views that he does have, which I share, is the valuation for freedom of speech, that nobody is going to be shut down because of bad thought. Yeah, or, or bad thought. And, you know, it's something that you and I were raised in the 80s. And I was certainly raised to understand uh, the fullness of the Bill of Rights the importance of the freedoms that were fought for for hundreds of years, certainly here in America, the value of the Magna Carta going back to Europe, um, things that we as society have achieved, where we were being de-achieving in the last 10 or 15 years. We were slowly use, losing these rights, and where we didn't lose the right, we were canceled. The law, and if we couldn't be canceled, we were banned. If we couldn't be banned, we were silenced. They have all these tools that we're using against us. Here, finally, we have somebody who had the money, the time, the patience uh, to understand that Twitter could be something better. Let's hope so. Let us do hope so. Uh, you had a couple of more new uh, news items I didn't get a yeah. chance to write down. Uh, little, little items that... Uh... In the business, in the investing world, there's a little adage. As soon as something appears on the cover of Time magazine as the next greatest thing, so, yes. that's the moment you sell. That's buy plastic, you sell. buy plastic, buy plastic. <laughs> well, Justin Welby is doing the church version of that. He's in Kiev right now, or Kiev, talking up the, uh, the Zelensky government. Everything's going to be great. The West is going to come to their rescue. The Ukrainians are brave people. I don't doubt the last one. But, you know, as soon as the ground freezes and the 700,000 troops and 1,500 tanks on the border uh, can move across the ground without sinking into the mud, it is my unprofessional opinion that, that the days of the Zelensky regime are, are numbered. I'm not one of these people that are saying that, oh, the Ukrainians will, you know, one of the things we don't read about in, the, in our media is that the sophisticated weapons systems that we're sending, like HIMARS, which is the trucks with the uh, anti-aircraft uh, anti missiles on the back of them, they're being driven and operated by British and American contractors because it takes a year to figure out how to use these things. So you don't just send them the equipment and say, here, fella, jump in and drive it. So, I mean, we've got mercenaries over there and using these expensive equipment that we're sending and while the tr Ukrainian troops on the ground, they've lost 100,000 men so far, and about twice that many is wounded. And the Russians can afford to throw cannon fodder at the Ukrainians. <laughs> they, they certainly did. There's a lot War. more of them than they are Ukrainians. Yeah. They did in World War One and World War Two. They had no trouble just wasting men on the front. But I'm a little different. I always, I'm the David supporter in a David and Goliath situation. Uh, even though Ukraine is almost as corrupt as Putin, uh, to me, they're the little guy. And uh, because I'm a Minnesota Vikings NFL supporter, I always go for, support the little guy. You know? I don't disagree with you, Kevin. I don't. I mean, it's, I would distinguish between who I want to win and who I think will win. Okay. Um, well, I, yeah, following I the David the source, I think them. I think David will win here. I, I want the uh, person who was attacked to be able to repel their attack. But, you know, one of the things that we don't understand here in the United States, and if you read the Russian media, you listen to what they're saying, and God help me, I do know a little bit of Russian, enough, enough to know that I'm ignorant, is that Putin, up until June, his military strategy was to, um, he didn't want to kill fellow Slavs. He wanted to basically not uh, destroy cities, not kill the population. He wanted to have surgical strikes, and he wanted to limit the number of troops involved to about 200,000. Well, that failed. Uh, this And it's now, since June, turned into a uh, real war on the level of the Second World War, where 
Putin is now taking out the infrastructure. He's doing what we did to the Germans, bombing their refineries, bombing their rail yards, bombing their electrical transmission facilities. And, you know, Ukraine is shortly going to be without food. It's going to shortly be without electricity. And then once the ground is hard enough for the tanks to move, you know, and, and the Russians going to lose lots of people because, you know, the American and British and German, mer Polish mercenaries that they've hired to operate the NATO equipment, they're going to take a toll on these people. But at the end of the day, I just don't see how the U Ukrainians are going to be able to pull this out short of some sort of miracle on the Volk, on the Dan, on the Dnieper. The Dnieper, I guess you say. <laughs> I, I know a little Russian too. My Russian goes back to the 80s perestroika. You know, the, the economic reforms the Soviet went through, Soviet Union went through. And in as such, I think uh, the weakness of Putin's ideas was uh, they have been frozen out of the world economy, except for China. And uh, China right now is going through its weakest mark as a nation uh, and is certainly still suffering from the drought, still suffering from full COVID lockdowns. I don't know how much China can support Russia in this. Um, and so I think going to the economics, not just the war and Putin's desire here, we'll have to see what the, the real long play is here. Uh, he can take Ukraine, but, you know, can he hold Ukraine? It didn't take uh, a lot of time for NATO to get Saddam out of Kuwait. I don't think uh, it will ever make it palatable for uh, Putin to hold Ukraine. We let him keep Crimea, of course, but that's a small fodder. No, but I, I, I think that what we we're misreading a lot of the European sentiment. Um, certainly the Poles want to fight the Russians to the last drop. Yep. But the Germans are ready to switch sides. See, I mean, oh, the Germans are... Surprise. You know, the, no, the Germans, Germany is going through a deindustrialization because the raw materials and the energy that funds the German, that fuels the German economy comes from Russia. Mm -hmm. And the Russians, I think, can hold out against hardship a lot longer than the Western Europeans. So I think we'll see the Germans, and you have now anti-NATO protests in Germany. Um, so... We'll, we'll see what happens. You know, the Hungarians and the Germans and uh, certainly the Serbs and some of the, you know, are ready. They've had enough. You know, they've the Ukraine fatigue is such that only the true believers like the Poles and the Biden administration and a few others are, uh, you know, willing to fight it to the last Ukrainian life. Okay, you guys have made it this through this far through the show. This is a great opportunity at the end of the show to go to the comment section. What do you think will happen in the long term between uh, Russia and Ukraine? But also uh, put your comments about Manira Nisa's uh, letter about the future of the Anglican Communion and what happens if uh, the Church of England decides to do uh, living life. What's LLF letter? And so, uh, you know, we, we want to get your uh, opinions in here as well. And, and do remember, do hear hear us rightly, and that it's not that we wish the Russians victory, but given the given the options that they're out there today, I am sadly concluding that one th it's going to go one direction. Mm -hmm. Kevin, with the same data, is thinking it's going the other direction. Well, you no, don't Kevin, know. <laughs> we don't. We don't know. But that is that is the realm of journalism in, in today's day, uh, day and age, George. There's so many fake news stories out there. You can't pick one from the other. Uh, we had a conversation just the other day about whether or not uh, we should wear a mask near a person who had COVID last week. Oh, I'm like Jill. Half the articles on the internet say yes, of course. The other half say, no, you're being a fool. You know, and there's just no way to make up your mind if you're going to use uh, the internet and journalism as your guide through making choices. Crazy. George, thank you for joining us for this show. I know it's late. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 775 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>